Hi, in this video, we'll first look at the content of the proposed amendment to the Mali Constitution and we'll look at what the government is trying to change. Then we'll look at the extent to which the constitutional referendum is appropriate or even legal. What is the government trying to change in the 1992 Constitution? There's a lot to be said about the revision bill, but in this video we will look at the most striking points, some of which most of you will have heard about. First of all, the oath of the President of the Republic no longer includes the commitment to protect the independence of Mali and the territorial integrity of the country. In the current constitution, which is subsequent to the 1991 Mali Revolution, the President of the Republic must be sworn in declaring, I swear, quote, to guarantee national unity, independence of the country, and the integrity of the national territory. Today, the government wishes to remove from this oath the obligation to protect the independence of Mali and territorial integrity. Here is what we have in the revision bill. I swear to guarantee national unity, comma, I pledge to do everything possible to achieve African unity. As you can see, the promise to guarantee the independence of Mali and the integrity of the territory has simply vanished. Just after the comma, which, by the way, should have been a full stop or a period. Now this begs the question, who benefits from that? Does the removal of the obligation to guarantee the independence of Mali and guarantee the integrity of the territory benefit the people of Mali? Or does this benefit others? Why would the president want to get rid of these obligations? The second sticking point in this attempt to revise the constitution is the treatment of the High Court of Justice. The High Court of Justice is an institution of which role is to judge the President of the Republic and the cabinet members, that in Mali we call ministers, for things that they committed while they were in office. So now, what is the government trying to do with the High Court of Justice? First of all, the government has removed the High Court of Justice from the list of institutions in the Republic. In the current 1992 constitution, we have a list of institutions of the Republic comprising eight institutions including the High Court of Justice. In the revision bill, the High Court of Justice has simply disappeared from the list of institutions of the Republic. The court still exists in the bill, but we're not clear about its status. If it's not an institution of the Republic, it's an institution of what? And also, why change that? Are we changing that for the people of Mali or for other people? In addition to deleting the High Court of Justice from the list of institutions of the Republic, the government is trying, with this revision bill, to reduce the reasons why the President of the Republic would be prosecuted before the High Court of Justice. In the 1992 Constitution, the High Court of Justice has the power to indict the President of the Republic and the ministers for high treason or for criminal law offenses they committed when they were in office. So what does that mean? That means that today, with our 1992 Constitution, if the President of the Republic commits a criminal law offense, he can be indicted before the High Court of Justice. For example, the President of the Republic may be tried by the High Court of Justice for offenses such as theft, extortion, abuse of authority, embezzlement, etc. In addition, still under the 1992 Constitution, the President can be indicted for high treason. Now, what the government is trying to change in this attempt to amend the Constitution is that, on one hand, the High Court of Justice can no longer judge the President of the Republic for criminal law offenses only ministers can be tried on those grounds. So this means that if the President of the Republic commits crimes such as theft, extortion, embezzlement, abuse of authority, nothing will happen to him, as far as the High Court is concerned. On the other hand, the bill says that the President can be indicted only for high treason, and the bill provides a narrow definition of high treason. Question. Does the fact that the President of the Republic can no longer be prosecuted for criminal offenses benefit the people of Mali or other people? Last but not least, regarding the High Court of Justice, the bill says that the indictment of the President must be voted by more than two-thirds of each House, i.e. more than two-thirds of the National Assembly and more than two-thirds of the Senate. Today, we don't have a Senate. We will come back to this later, but the revision bill provides for the creation of a Senate. And there's a special thing with this Senate. It's that according to the bill, the President of the Republic would have the privilege of appointing by himself a third of the Senators. We can therefore consider that these Senators will be on the President's side. The other two-thirds of the Senators are elected indirectly, so we won't have much visibility on what's going on in the Senate. 
Today, the people representatives in Parliament are elected directly. So going back to the President of the Republic's judgment by the High Court of Justice, the only way to indict a President of the Republic in office with a two-thirds majority in the Senate is that 100% of the Senators not appointed by the President, plus one rogue Senator appointed by the President, because two-thirds is not enough, we need the majority of two-thirds. So all those people will have to vote in favor of the indictment. And then we realize that this is not possible. So, in a nutshell, the proposed amendments indicate that the High Court of Justice is no longer part of the list of institutions of the Republic. In addition, it can no longer judge the President of the Republic for criminal law offenses. And finally, the President of the Republic no longer has to worry about being prosecuted for high treason because more than two-thirds of the National Assembly and more than two-thirds of the Senators will need to vote for his indictment. And, as we've seen, this is not possible regarding the Senate because the President of the Republic would appoint a third of the Senators. The consequences of such an amendment is that the President of the Republic would never have to face the High Court of Justice for criminal law offenses or for high treason. And this results in a total impunity of the President of the Republic. So who does this benefit? Now, let's see what the revision bill makes of our institutions. First, we have an institution that disappears, the High Council for Local Authorities. In French, it's Au Conseil des Collectivités Territoriales. At a glance, one would think that the High Council for Local Authorities would be replaced by the Senate, but if the Senate were to exist, the Senate would have far more powers than the High Council for Local Authorities. The Senate would be able to make laws with the National Assembly, while today, the High Council of Local Authorities can only give opinions on local and regional development policies. And this, in accordance with the 1992 Constitution, and also, the High Council meets for two sessions of only 30 days maximum. That's it for the High Council for Local Authorities. And now, let's look at the Senate. As we have seen, the President of the Republic appoints a third of the Senators. This is a new institution, and it would be fair to ask how much it would cost. To get a vague idea of how much this would cost, we can look at the budget allocated to the National Assembly for 2017. And, as you can see, we have almost 16 billion francs for 2017. It would not be realistic to suggest that the budget allocated to the High Council for Local Authorities could be reallocated to the Senate because, as we've seen, the role and the powers of the Senate would be much broader. So, in 2017, for the National Assembly, we have a budget of nearly 16 billion. So we can assume that the Senate will have a budget more or less similar for its normal affairs. But as this is a new institution, it will need to be housed, in addition to that, the Senate will need senators, and for the senators that were not fortunate enough to be appointed by the President of the Republic, they will need to be elected. So, elections will have to be organized, and that costs money. Adding it all up, we can easily exceed the $25 billion mark. We are talking about public money. We are talking about taxpayers' money. We are talking about foreign aid to the people of Mali. We are talking about the loans made to the Mali government that the people of Mali will have to pay back. Why spend so much for a legislative institution that would be significantly controlled by the President of the Republic? As we've seen with such a Senate, there would be virtually no chance to prosecute the President of the Republic before the High Court of Justice. Once again, the same question, who benefits from this proposed change? Finally, the government introduces another institution, the Court of Audit, for the audit of the use of public funds. The government was visibly inspired by the French system. As a matter of fact, the Court of Audit is an institution that was created under Napoleon, so in the 19th century. Today, it still exists in France, and its mission is, among other things, to help the parliament control the action of the government when it comes to finance. Many provisions of the bill relating to the Court of Audit have been copied and pasted from the French Constitution. However, one thing was not copied and pasted, and it's the following provision. Quote, the Court of Audit assists the Parliament in controlling the actions of the government. In the revision bill, what we see is the Court of Audit assists the Parliament and the government in controlling the implementation of the Budget Act and in the assessment of public policies. So here the government wants to create a court of audit, but its purpose is not to control the action of the government, but rather to control officials at a lower level. Another thing about the proposed creation of a court of audit is we don't know its composition. 
and we don't know how its members are going to be appointed. So we don't know the extent to which the Court of Audit will be independent. To wrap up about the institutions, the bill wants the institutions to look like this, i.e. a Senate, with a third of the senators appointed by the President of the Republic, a constitutional court, with a third of the members appointed by the President of the Republic, a higher council of magistrates, which primary function is to ensure the independence of the judiciary, is to be chaired by the President of the Republic, who will also be the President of that Council, a Supreme Court, which in Mali is the highest judicial jurisdiction, of which the President is appointed via the Higher Council of Magistrates, which has the President of the Republic as its President. And that's it for the institutions. In order to run for President of the Republic, one must be exclusively Malian of origin. This means that the government wants to ensure that anyone who's both a Mali national and a national of another country will be denied the right to run for president. But be careful. Being exclusively Malian does not mean that one has to hold only a Malian passport. It is not because you have only one passport that you have only one nationality. Most countries in the world apply the right of lineage when it comes to nationality. That means that nationality is transmitted to descendants and is inherited by birth. For example, say you have a Malian mother and a Senegalese father, and you have lived all your life in Mali, without ever setting foot in Senegal or touching a Senegalese passport. Then, you are a Mali national from your mother and a Senegalese national from your father, whether you like it or not. That is to say that the day you want to obtain a Senegalese passport, you will not need to go through the naturalization process. Instead, you'll need to prove your lineage. And this can go on and on and on from generation to generation. This is the case for Senegal. But it's also the case for countries that share a border with Mali, such as Burkina Faso, Niger, Mauritania, Ivory Coast, or Guinea. And also, we must remember that in 1960, when the parents of a young adult of today were born, or when the grandparents of a child of today were born, Mali looked like that, the Federation of Mali, including Senegal. And before the Federation of Mali, the borders were again different. And before colonization, there was a succession of empires covering those countries, and as a result, the countries in the region share a very similar culture. So naturally, marriages have always taken place regardless of borders the borders, rather than the people, have moved. Actually, it would not be unreasonable to assume that there are more Malians with two nationalities than there are Malians with two passports. For example, ask anyone who's got no interest in football. Which of these two teams are the Mali team and the Guinea team? So, if you have to be exclusively Malian of origin, that means that even if you manage to relinquish your second nationality inherited by lineage, which is, by the way, very difficult, you will never be able to run for president of the republic because the exclusivity of the nationality must be from the origin, i.e. from birth. Why would this be taken away from the Malians? Can you imagine the problems this would cause? A person might try to eliminate his political rival by saying that his great-great-grandfather was not Malian. Then things would turn even messier and dirtier. Look at what happened not so long ago in Côte d'Ivoire, where it was said that Alassane Guterra was not a true Ivorian. Look at the number of deaths. Look at the giant step back that country took, whereas it was quite well off. And also, doesn't the constitution, including the oath, make it clear that the president of the republic is supposed to promote and protect African unity? So how can such discrimination be justified? And then, let's not forget the Mali expatriates. Throughout Africa and beyond, they are admired for their solidarity with their community in the host country and towards those they've left in Mali. Even those who have never had a chance to go to school actively contribute to the development of their hometown or their region. They go so far as to provide public services which the government fails to provide, such as bringing water, electricity, making schools, making roads. And under what conditions do they live? Under what conditions do they leave their country? Most of the time, they're too embarrassed to discuss about this. However, lately, the media has been increasingly unveiling almost daily tragedies. So why such discrimination? Some will say that it is because we want to ensure the president's loyalty towards Mali. But if we want to push nonsense to its peak, then why not prohibit heads of states from marrying someone with a different nationality? It is always complicated to evidence someone's motives, so let's not speculate further. But we can revert to our good old practice question, i.e. who benefits 
from excluding a patriotic and competent Malian ready to serve his country just because he also has another nationality, even if he has devoted his whole life to the development of Mali. One thing is for sure, is that such discrimination is unheard of in Mali. Mali is known to have always been an open, tolerant, and inclusive country. Now let's look at the last sticking point regarding the content of the revision bill. In the 1992 constitution currently in force, the people of Mali are in charge of approving any amendments to the constitution by referendum. Today, the government wishes to remove this right from the people. In the revision bill, the president of the republic alone, without the parliament, will decide whether or not a referendum should take place to amend the constitution. If he unilaterally decides not to take the referendum route, then parliament will vote on the amendment and, as you know, parliament includes, according to the bill, the National Assembly and the Senate, and it's 33% of senators appointed by the President of the Republic. Then, we are told that we shouldn't worry because the President of the Republic will not have the freedom to choose when it comes to modifying the number of terms in office and the duration of those terms in office. However, this does not take away any risks because the President would control most institutions. Therefore, transparency at the polling stations and within the institutions involved in elections would be less than guaranteed. We are also told that we can't organize a referendum each time we want to rectify the imperfections in the Constitution. It's true that the Constitution contains imperfections that could have been avoided. However, the bill contains even more imperfections. And here, we're not talking about the substance because it's currently being debated, but we're talking about the form. First of all, the draft bill that circulated between Parliament and the government contained over 300 spelling mistakes, or errors of syntax, punctuation, you name it. You can see them here. Obviously, this is all in French, but for example, in French, the legal term referring to a legal entity, like a corporation, for example, is personne morale, literally moral person. Here, what we have is personne miracle, i.e. miracle person. Even the front page, the headed paper of the draft bill has spelling mistakes, even in the name of the commission that transferred the document. Once voted, the draft bill was cleaned up. But in the official revision bill that was destined to be published in the official government register, we can find over 50 errors. Riclos has an S and not a T at the end of Rie. Article 8 of the bill has a numbering error. It should refer to the amendment of Title 7 and not to the amendment of Title 8, since Article 9 is the article that amends Title 8 of the Constitution. In addition, the bill, in deleting from the President's oath the commitment to protect the independence of the country and the territorial integrity, left the comma instead of adding a full stop or period. Almost each paragraph of the bill shows that the basic rules regarding the use of capital letters are not mastered. Actually, the drafters do not follow any rules in this respect. However, those rules do exist. For instance, regarding the use of capital letters to write months and days, you can see here what the French Academy has to say. And by the way, the French Academy is the official authority on the use of the French language. Then, you might ask, why is it such a big deal? Why are you being so nitpicky? But doesn't Mali deserve to have its most fundamental document drafted with the utmost rigor? Why promulgate a rough draft and then tell us a few years later that the document contains clerical errors? If the utmost rigor is not applied to a text as fundamental as the country's constitution, what does that mean for the rest of the country's affairs? We have spent quite a bit of time on the content of the amendments proposed by the government. Now let's look at the extent to which it's appropriate to amend the Constitution. Article 118 of our current 1992 Constitution provides that no revision process can be triggered or sustained when the territorial integrity of the country is threatened. What's the meaning of territorial integrity? Since the Constitution is drafted in French, we will look at the word integrity in the French Lahouz Dictionary. And what do we find? Something which has all its components which has not been reduced or severed. For example, territorial integrity, integrity of a piece of work. And then one might say, that's all good, but what about the territorial integrity in international law? Okay, 
Let's look at the successive mandates of the UN forces in Mali, i.e. the MINISMA. The UN Security Council's resolutions that allow MINISMA's presence in Mali have consistently indicated that the armed groups in northern Mali do not acknowledge Mali's territorial integrity and demand that they respect such integrity. In addition, on June 29, 2017, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution to renew the MINUSMA's mandate in Mali by again requiring all armed groups in Mali to recognize unconditionally the territorial integrity of the state of Mali. So if the territorial integrity problem has already been resolved, why do we refer to it on June 29, 2017? And what is the UN talking about? Is it talking about invasion by a foreign country? No. The UN refers to the armed groups in northern Mali, and we should not forget that the MINISMA is still continuing to suffer casualties in northern Mali. And we have no concrete elements showing that the state has regained full control of the entire country. Therefore, we can consider that today, the integrity of the Malian territory is still threatened. And actually, if this were not the case, one might think that the government would not have tried to remove from the oath the promise to guarantee the territorial integrity and the independence of the country, as we've seen earlier. In light of the current situation in the country, and in accordance with Article 118 of our Constitution, it's difficult to envision how a revision process could be triggered. Still regarding the timeliness and the relevance of the constitutional revision, some supporters of the referendum say they support it because the revision would allow Mali citizens living abroad to be represented in the National Assembly. It's true. The revision bill provides such a representation. But there are two things to bear in mind. The first thing is that the government now wishes to discriminate between those who are only Malian and those who are Malian and have another nationality when it comes to the presidential election. The second thing is that the 1992 constitution does not prevent the representation of Mali citizens who live abroad from being represented in the National Assembly. In reality, it is not even necessary to amend the constitution to allow Malians from outside to be represented in parliament. What the constitution actually does is to allow, through organic law, to determine the number of members of parliament and their conditions of eligibility. So nothing prevents an organic law to allow Malians living abroad from having their representatives in parliament. So is it really the will of the government? Why don't they just do it? even without a constitutional amendment. We are also told that the revision is necessary to take into account the Algiers agreements. The revision project tells us that Mali is governed in a deconcentrated and decentralized manner. But the current constitution does not contradict that. It does not say that Mali is a concentrated and centralized state. So why amend the constitution if we do not contradict it? The truth is, if we look at the content of the constitutional amendments, we can see that they have the consequences of reducing the obligations of the President of the Republic, increasing his control over the institutions, and acting with impunity. Many people say that that's part of human nature, that when someone has power, very often he wants more, and more, and more, even if he came to power with very good intentions. To control that, we need checks and balance. Today. The only counterpower in Mali is the street. It is the people. This was the case in 1991, and it's still the case today. But this cannot last indefinitely. The people cannot do all the work. What we need are institutions that also play the role of safeguard. If we want to change the constitution, why not? Provided the institutions are reinforced, provided the institutions are made more independent, and there is a real counterpower at the state level, and not only at the street level. Then, no problem. But until this happens, we must remain vigilant.